Uh, hello, everyone, again. Thank you for joining in to another live Q&A session uh, for questions about fertility. Today, our, the title of our talk is Recurrent IVF Failure. And it's a very, very tough topic, and it can be devastating for couples. And basically, when we talk about recurrent IVF failure, it was when couples go through a couple of IVF cycles, and it doesn't work. So today, we'll try to dissect the IVF cycle and to try to figure out why it does not work. So we'll go through all your questions and we'll try to answer those questions as much as we can. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Shari Kashaba and I go by my first name, Shari. And I'm a fertility specialist at IVF Australia and I work in City, Alexandria, Cogra and Miranda. So I took a few locations. And I, by trade, I'm an obstetrician and a gynecologist. But seven years ago, I decided to dedicate all my work to fertility and became a fertility specialist. And I do it seven days a week from seven to seven almost. Now, when I do my fertility clinics, I meet a lot of couples and they come for second and third opinions and they go, why did my cycle did not work? And we discuss it and we go through uh, this whole cycle from the beginning to the end. And it always, always points down or boils down to two basic things. It's either the soil or the seed. And by I mean the embryo that we put back in, back in and the lining of the uterus. So these are the two things that majorly contribute to an IVF cycle success rate. So today, we're gonna go through your questions and try to answer them as much as we can. So we got Rainbow. Hi, Rainbow, good evening. <laughs> and we can see like three, 30 people joined us. So if anyone can shoot a question, we can start with that. If not, I'm gonna start with talking about uh, the success rates of IVF cycles. So Catherine, she's our first question over here. Thank you, Catherine, for sending the first question. So hi, Dr. Shadi. My FET cycle, which is frozen embryo transfer, we were putting an embryo back in, did not have an ultrasound before the frozen embryo transfer. Is it possible that the blastocyst transfer because of the endometrial lining was not adequate for implantation since an ultrasound was not performed to check i make it easy more to check this. Very good questions. So I'll, t I'll discuss it with you. So basically, Catherine, how many embryos did you put back in uh, prior to this FET cycle? We know roughly when we put an embryo back in, depends on your age, that will reflect on a success rate. But an ultrasound prior to an embryo transfer is very important. And that will tell us if the lining is thick enough or too thin. Not only that, actually, during the transfer itself, we need to have an ultrasound. So you can see where the catheter or the embryo is going in and to make sure that you're putting the embryo in the right location. And we know actually by studies, and it's been proven, that when you do a transfer under ultrasound guidance, produce higher success rates. So back to your questions. Do we do ultrasound prior to the F frozen embryo transfer? Yes, we do a few ultrasounds just to, just to check if the lining is thick enough. And if it's thick enough, then it's good, ahead, good to go ahead with the transfer. And during the transfer, yes, we need an ultrasound so I can see where I put the embryo back in. Hmm. And Rainbow, hi Rainbow, said, Rainbow asked me, I had 13 eggs and only one fertilized, became five days blastocyst, sent to PTS, which is a genetic testing of that five days embryo, and only to find out that it has monosomy and trisomy. I was also, uh, I also had a miscarriage with trisomy 18. My husband had balanced translocation 13 and 14. Uh, my fertility specialist said there is nothing to do with this sperm. How can we increase our chances to produce good quality eggs and sperm? Very good question, Rainbow. That covers basically most of our fertility uh, talk when we talk in the clinic. So we try to dissect the cycle and I'll go through it in a bit more detail. So when you go through an IVF cycle, we stimulate your ovaries to produce more eggs. And when we collect those eggs, we hope that most of them are mature eggs. Now, when we got 13 eggs, 
we have to look at it. What kind of procedure did you have during the lab? So did we have an IVF, which is basically IVF. We get the sperm, we get the eggs, and we put them in the dish overnight and let magic happen overnight. We'd also play romantic music on that night to see which sperm will fertilize the eggs. Or did they do an ICSI, which ICSI basically, they pick out the egg and remove the shelter of uh, the cells that surrounds the egg. And we pick up the sperm and we inject it inside the eggs to make sure they fertilize. Now, depends on if we had IVF or ICSI, if the low fertilization rate is due to IVF, then probably I'd recommend to go to ICSI. But again, we do not know what was the reason of that. Now, was it maturity of the eggs or not maturity of the eggs? Now, if they were all immature, you can't fertilize immature eggs. And that might be related to uh, the stimulation protocol. And you need to discuss with your fertility specialist to improve the fertilization rate. So when you get 13 eggs and you get only one fertilized out of the 13, that tells us there is a fertilization issue over here. Because we expect the fertilization rate out of the mature eggs to be roughly two thirds to three quarters. So it's a 50, 60 to 70 percent of fertilization rate. Any less than that, there is an issue with fertilization. So I would dissect that point and look at it. Why did I have less fertilization at this point? Now, if I go, how often is superficial? Catherine, endometriosis, a cause of recurrent IVF failure. How much does laparoscopic removal of superficial and mild endometriosis improve IVF success rates? and frozen embryo transfer at least. Are there any good studies on this? Very good question, Catherine, very good questions. So the question is about endometriosis, and unfortunately it is a very common condition. Almost one in five women would have endometriosis in the general population. And it have multiple kind of variety of symptoms. Could be, they don't have symptoms at all. Some of them will have painful period. Some of them have problems falling pregnant. And some of them will have like painful intercourse or sex. So endometriosis is very difficult to find in the general population. But you tell me, well, what about if you do IVF and you know you have endometriosis? The studies are very weak and they can't actually randomize patients. Oh, we did uh, surgery or we did not, did not do surgery. But what we do know that when you do IVF and you collect the eggs, especially with mild endometriosis, when you collect the eggs and take them outside the body and you fertilize them in the dish and you move them inside, you bypass the endometriosis for that. So endometriosis, if you treat it, can improve your natural uh, success rates, but not within the IVF cycle. So once you move to IVF, the, endo the superficial endometriosis wouldn't play a role in the implantation of that embryo hmm. or the process. So we got Hannah. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Dr. Shari. I got a positive pregnancy test after the frozen embryo transfer. Then the second test, the week later, the pregnancy has gone as the HCG level too low, unfortunately. Mama, please know why or what may have caused the HCG level to drop. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, Hannah. Unfortunately, this, what happened is miscarriage. And miscarriage, unfortunately, is a common thing and becomes more common as women get older. It's almost one in six in younger women and becomes when women reach around the age of 45, becomes around two out of three will have uh, miscarriage at that stage. So what we look at, what causes the miscarriage? And again, it's one or two things. It's either the soil or the seed. But in most cases, it's the seed that there's something happened with the seed. And we talk about what was the problem with the seed. And when we talk about the problem with the seed, most likely is genetics with the seed. So the genetics of the seed, as uh, uh, we had a questions before about the genetics and trisomy and transplication, is our, we as human, our genes come in big folders. We call them chromosomes. Hmm. And we have a full set of chromosomes, we assume, 46 of that, and they're either XX or XY. Now, sometimes when you make an egg or the embryo is developed, they have to split the genetic material. And sometimes they don't split equally because you have to split your genetic material because the other half comes from the sperm. So the egg has only half of the genetic material. And if it has more genetic material or less genetic material because of errors of splitting, 
usually if those they do not progress and produce a pregnancy. So nature takes care of it and they do not continue the pregnancy. The only few conditions that can actually progress and produce a pregnancy are like trisomy 21, which is like Down syndrome, when you have an extra copy of number 21, that folder, you have three copies of that, that's Down syndrome. And another three conditions, and that's why I say, well, let's screen for it at around 10 weeks uh, during the pregnancy to make sure that uh, there's no any problems with the pregnancy. But most likely, the, um, for, um, unfortunately, the pregnant and the miscarriage happen due to genetic abnormalities of the embryo, and that's just nature to six course. Now, if that happens more than once or happened twice or three times, it's still the chances are good because it's just unlucky. But after, if it happens more than two times, we say, stop, let's look at the various reasons. Let's dissect the whole uh, issues with the soil and make sure there's nothing wrong with the soil. So we do a full spectrum of investigations to make sure nothing is wrong with the soil before trying again. Hmm. So, Tanya, hi, hi Tanya, I see more, it's a long question. Hi, I have had IVF failure, but failure as in I have no stimulation from the medication and keep having cycles cancelled due to no follicles or follicles not big enough. Last cycle, I got to egg collection, however, there were no eggs in the follicle. I have now about six sank cancel cycles. Mm. Well, very good question. So this moves us for the IVF cycle to an earlier point of the cycle. So unlike it, problems with later with the fertilization, dissecting it, we're looking at the beginning with the stimulation protocol. Now, there's a lot of things that play into that part. So we have to check what is your egg reserve that we start with? And when we start the cycle, what was the follicle count? Or we do ultrasound to count the small follicles that we're trying to grow and develop at the beginning of the cycle. And we decide we do blood tests at the beginning of the cycle to say, oh, is it a good month or not a good month? Let's try the next cycle. And depends on the protocol that we use. Is it we're not getting any follicles to develop? Is it the dose dependent? Do we need to increase the dose to get better response? Or do we need to add a few other additions to our stimulation to get a better response? Now, sometimes it can be the ovary is less sensitive to the medication that we give. So what we do is we actually modify the regular IVF cycle and we change the medication a little bit. So we can give you some medications to give the ovary a bit of rest so it doesn't get exposed to any hour of stimulation and then we start stimulating it in the hope that we can get more eggs. But again, most of the cases, if you got follicles over there and you can develop them, we can collect eggs out of them in the hope. So, Jane, your thoughts on transplanting two embryos on the first cycle? All right, Jane, very good question, all right? Uh, well, to put two, two embryos back in, we'll go back uh, to the cycle. So, in, in, the, in the past, we used to put two embryos, three embryos back in uh, because he, we had less success rates and we couldn't grow the embryos up to day five, so the baby to day five. But in Australia, because we got very good success rates, we decided to put one embryo back in. And why, why did we decide that? Well, we decided, well, when you have one, one embryo put back in, we reduce the chances of twins because twins has their own risks. So what, what are the risks of twins? We say, well, in the first three months of the pregnancy, if you divide the pregnancy into trimesters, first, second, and third, well, the first trimester, there is increased risk of miscarriage, and you'll have more symptoms during the pregnancy, like nausea, vomiting, and the breast tenderness, all these will be increased. When you move to the second trimester, which is the second three months, you'll have more symptoms of uh, like the uh, miscarriage and blood pressure problems, blood sugar problems. Now the problem comes when you go to the third trimester and you might have preterm delivery or very early delivery. Uh, the children will need to, or the babies will need to go to the neonatal ICU and they will need help with breathing, they'll need help with their nutrition, sometimes with the liver function, uh, to liver to uh, detoxify and they'll need antibiotics and a lot of help at the early stage. 
And when they leave the neonatal ICU, they'll have problems later in life when we compare them to their peers for hearing problems, seeing problems, breathing problems. And some studies suggest that even IQ level slightly few points drop. So we save one healthy child at a time. All right, so put two back in just to increase my chances. Well, <laughs> yes and no. When we put two embryos back in, depends on your age. It does not double the chances of pregnancy. So it just increases it slightly. And why is that? Well, let's think about that in a little bit. Say you've got uh, six embryos. So you've got six beautiful embryos. Now studies have shown if you put those six, at each one, one at a time, after a few years, you'll have three babies. Hmm. Now, what if I put them two at a time, at three times? Hmm. So instead of putting one, 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 and you have three babies, you'll put two, two, and two. You'll end up having two babies. What? Where did that third baby go? Well, some studies suggest that when you put one good embryo back in and one embryo that is not great, it's not going to produce pregnancy, can affect the good one. And I can actually create an environment inside the uterus that is not good for implantation and does not help the good embryo to grow. So that can reduce the chances. So we always suggest put one good embryo at a time. So. I hope that answers your questions. Uh, hi, Dr. Shari, what are your thoughts on recurrent implantation failure? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, Mel, very, very good question. And it has a lot of parts to cover. And again, when you talk about recurrent implantation failure, this is when we have a beautiful embryo at day five. So five days old and it looks great under microscope. And we put it back in, does not produce a pregnancy. What? And then you take a deep breath and you try again. Well, we've got this great embryo. Let's take it out and we'll put it back in. And it doesn't produce a pregnancy. And it can be sh shattering, but we'll have to look at it. Why is it not working? So we, we dissect it again to the basic two things. It's either the soil or either the seed. And the seed, as I mentioned, is the genetics of the seed. So we say, can we test that embryo? Yes, we can test them. And we make sure that they have the full chromosomes or the full folders of the genetic material, not missing one and not do not have an extra one. Now with the soil, we have to dissect that too to make sure there is nothing wrong with the soil. So we have a lot of tests that we look into and we look at your metabolic status, make sure you don't have too high insulin, your blood sugar is controlled, your thyroid is working perfectly fine, you don't have any thyroid antibodies that are affecting it. And we check your autoimmune, is it, do you have the your immune system, is it too high actually? Is it actually affecting the implantation? So we look into that immune system too. And we rule out any problems inside the cavity. So we put the embryo back in inside the uterus and we think the cavity is fine. Is there something wrong inside there that is actually preventing the embryo from implanting? So we do a scope, put a camera just inside the uterus and have a look inside. If there was any problem, we remove it too. And at the same time, when we look inside the uterus to make sure there is nothing in, in there, we try to take a bit of tissue from the lining of the uterus. And that tissue, we take a sample from the lining to make sure there is no any inflammation, no any infection, and it's actually growing bright stage. There is no any problem with the growth of the embryo and uh, the lining, and it's actually responding to your hormones. Hmm. And uh, we test all of those and make sure that we got everything right before putting the third embryo back in because these are actually very very precious embryos and you don't want to keep putting it back in putting it back in putting it back in just cross your fingers and hope to get a different results uh, so i'll go back hopefully that answers your question mel and catherine what do you consider a current ivf failure three good quality blastocyst transfers which has have failed uh, according to the definition of that, that suits, yes, Catherine, recurrent implantation failure. When you put three good quality blastocysts that do not produce pregnancy, that is considered recurrent implantation failure. Uh, and this is demands for us to look at for an answer. So we do a, a whole bunch of tests, blood tests and the sample of the wound to make it from the endometrium or the lining of the cavity to make sure that there's nothing wrong with that. And Catherine, what tests do you routinely perform for someone who had recurrent IVF failure? Now, it depends on the tests that we've done, because usually when I see a couple at the first
first visit or a person who's trying to fall pregnant. Uh, I do a lot of tests at the first visit. So I cover a lot of the recurrent implantation failure screen at the first visit. It's uh, part of the thyroid functions, the thyroid antibodies, the genetics, which is the carrier type to, to make sure that you have the full set. And tell me, well, I'm sure I have the full set and make everything you look normal. Yes. Uh, as Rainbow mentioned in the beginning, I mean, we could have the full set of genetic material, all the folders, we call them the chromosomes, but sometimes we have them shuffled around. <laughs> so if they're shuffled around these chromosomes, I have the full set of genetic material and I'm fine. But if I come to make sperm and they shuffled around and split or make an egg and split, they don't produce the full uh, uh, character. One of the sperm or the egg will have extra copy, one will have missing copy, and that could produce problems. So these are some of the tests that you do it at the first visit. Also, nutrition, to make sure that everything is fine, like the vitamin D levels. Mm -hmm. You have to check that. It can lead to less successful of implantation of IVF. So we make sure all of these are present at the first visit. And Julia, uh, Julia Lavenda, I go through that. Hi, doctor. Thank you for your time. I have had nine failed transfers now. I'm sorry to hear that, Julia. Of A and B gray blastocysts. I had endometriosis excised before and my last three transfers are still no success. We have done everything but an immune protocol with transfers and tested negative for killer cells, but positive to DQ alpha match. What are your thoughts on the immune protocol when transfers have failed? I have done progesterone and aspirin on each transfer. Uh, Julia, very good question. So now having nine failed transfers of a grade A and grade B blastocysts just baffles everyone. And uh, we do tests on the immune protocol. So we do natural killer cells and some sort of DQ. And there is other immune cells that to check the uh, compatibility between you and your partner's blood tests. And there is some evidence to support that, but the evidence is still very weak. And what we call it is anecdotal evidence, because we've got some patients, true, they fell pregnant when they tried the immune protocol, or they call it, depends on the location, some people call it the Bondi protocol. So they give you some uh, immunosuppressants, like uh, prednisone. And the whole idea of it is like, okay, the embryo or the baby is genetically only half yours, but half of it is probably your partner's. So maybe your body is fighting it because it's considered it is not natural to your body and it goes and attacks it. So it's like an allergic to the embryos. So if you have an allergy, we give you some steroids to lower the allergy. If you got a new skin like eczema, you put a steroid creams. And the same concept, you can give some steroids to lower your immune system. But there is caveats to that. Well, we have to discuss it and discuss what is the advantage and disadvantage for that, because every medication has its own risks. So we have to discuss it with your specialist and see what is the advantage of using that, what is the disadvantage of using that, and the risks. Uh, but if you have nine failed transfers and you found that, I'll leave it to you and your fertility specialist. The, one of the major side effects of the uh, using the steroids is the weight gain. So you'll gain a bit of weight. And we know that there is risk, can increase the risk of cleft lip and cleft blood, and increases it by almost four times. But the risk is still minimum. So the risk in the general population is one in a thousand when on steroids can increase it to four in a thousand. But it's a very, very long discussion, and you have to reach an agreement uh, with your sp specialist before actually starting that tre treatment. And uh, so, hope that answers your question. We've got Sarah, Sarah Howarth. What sort of supplements should I be taking for low MH? The book starts with an egg, recommends quite a lot. And uh, is it worth taking with do without doctor's consultation? Uh, Sarah, very good questions. Uh, the, now, I always recommend to be open and honest with your fertility specialist. I want to hear about every aspect of your life. What do you eat? What supplements do you take? What kind of exercise are you doing? Are you taking any supplements? Are you taking any medications? Are you taking any drugs? 
and party drugs in the past, do you smoke, occasionally not smoke. So all of these will affect and we'll have to dissect it and know it and discuss it. Now, taking the medications or recommendations for our supplements depends where you're getting it. And uh, we have a lot of suppliers of uh, natural supplements. And the component of it, unfortunately, is not regulated. Hmm. So when you go get it from over the shelf and they tell you, say, like co CoQ10 or melatonin, uh, and they say, oh, it's six times melatonin or six X. I'm like, what is even that? We don't even know what's the con constituent of that. So there's a lot of some supplements that are being sold in shops that are not controlled. Now, what supplements that usually I d discuss it with my patients and do we discuss the evidence behind it? Because it comes like weak evidence to it. Now, there is two things, the low AMH and the quality of the eggs. Now, with low AMH, actually, it has nothing to do with the quality of the eggs. The low AMH will tell you you have lower egg numbers when you stimulate, but it has no role in improving the egg quality. Now, I'm assuming you're talking about improving the egg quality. Uh, there are some supplements that suggest that if you take them, you can improve the egg quality. And they play majorly on being a strong antioxidant. So they say the egg becomes too sensitive to oxidants around it, and they can destroy a bit of the DNA of the egg. So we try to preserve it by giving more antioxidants. And the antioxidants that have been studied, like coenzyme Q10 and the melatonin, uh, there have been shown some improvement in uh, uh, in the egg quality. But again, these studies have been shown that some other studies show that there is no any benefit of that. So it's controversial. But what we know is so far, we haven't seen harm from using the coenzyme 210 and melatonin for that. Of course, any additional supplements, uh, you have to discover with, the, with your fertility specialist and see what you're taking and what's the constituents of those supplements and the fillers. Because some of them have active ingredients and can actually falsely affect your fertility. Because sometimes they have fillers of uh, external estrogen and you don't want any estrogen like phytoestrogen to take it out while you're going on a cycle. Uh, so I'll move to the next questions. Julia, what are your thoughts on recurrent implantation failure and trying immune protocol when all else have failed? Many thanks. Uh, I think I answered that earlier to, yeah, the Julia, I think you, you asked that in the past. And I think definitely uh, have, it, have a discussion with your fertility specialist. And uh, we, we do have like a special consent form when you go through that and know all the implications and have a continuous talk with your fertility specialist. Uh, there are a lot of patients that have been on the immune protocol, protocol and uh, they actually felt pregnant and they have live birth with that. Now, you tell me this is like a strong evidence. Now, it's, we call it anecdotal. That means you look backward and said, uh, I've used the immune and worked. Uh, doesn't mean that if you have a controlled and proper prospective study. Uh, but we see a lot of patients that we uh, have started immune protocol, and you can see pregnancies out of that. Hmm. Uh, Fiona, Fiona, does having adenomyosis and endometriosis cause implantation failure with IVF? All right, so very good question. I'll get a model. Do I have the model? Oh, we've got one over here. Hmm. Right. So Fiona is asking about endometriosis and adenomyosis. So endometriosis is basically when you have the lining of the womb over here, anywhere outside the uterus. So you've got one over here, these spots over here. These are endometriosis over here. You've got a bit of endometriosis over here. And these are the lining of the womb. So every time you get your period, you bleed on the inside, but this one bleeds on the outside. So it has nowhere to go. So the body goes to clear it out and creates a bit of scar tissue and inflammation. Now, adenomyosis is actually when it's present inside the wall of the uterus over here. So inside the wall, over here. So when you bleed inside, over here, it stays inside the wall. Now, the, the presence of endometriosis is questionable if it can affect the implantation failure. It's very dubious, but it hasn't been proven. The one that can be proven that can reduce adenomyosis uh, can reduce the implantation failure. And what do we do with that? Okay, if you put one embryo, it doesn't work. 
second embryo doesn't work and you know that you have adenomyosis, we try to change the protocol for the embryo transfer. So what do we do? We try to give the uterus a bit of rest. So instead of every month you're getting your period and you're bleeding inside over here, well, let's give you a medication that will keep it quiet for a month or two. And then we give you a bit of hormones to just thicken the lining, as I said, to make it thick enough. So we, when we put the embryo back in, it has thick, nice lining that will accept the embryo. And that will reduce the amount of adenomyosis over here and the effect of the implantation. Now, how does it have an effect? It's still questionable. But if you do have adenomyosis and if you had to put back in, it doesn't work, then that's the way to go. Hmm. Uh, Rambo, you're welcome. And Melanie, Halliday, oh, hi, Shadi, biggest fan here. Just letting you know our little one. Oh, Melanie, how are you? <laughs> Arriving next week, that's to you. We got our two girls. Well, <laughs> nice, nice to see you, you joined in and uh, Facebook Live. Uh, you can see my eyes or haircut. I've lost a few hairs. I'm not, I'm not good at hair cutting my hair. All right, Jane, also, what do you recommend for simple things that we can do at home to start? Hmm. I'm not sure, Jane, can you elaborate a little bit? Uh, simple things to start what, actually? Uh, uh, another question, so I'll move, I'll, I'll wait for your uh, 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 follow up on that question, Jane. Rainbow, another question is with long agonist protocol using nasal spray. And this protocol is that means there is better outcome in terms of having good quality eggs and produce numbers of blastocysts. Uh, very good question. So Rainbow is asking me the protocol and the protocols, they, there are many actually the protocols, but the big ones are, we will call one the short and the long. Mm. So the short one is almost 90% of our cases, that are our patients that we go for and that you saw with. And that's most of uh, our couple that they go through with treatment or patients. They have the same treatment as called the short one. The longer one, we start with a, either nasal spray or another injection that gives the ovary a bit of a rest. The idea that when you give the ovary a bit of rest, you can produce better uh, quality eggs and numbers of eggs. Now the blastocyst, hopefully when you get better quality eggs and better number of eggs, you'll have more blastocysts. And yes, well, the idea behind that uh, rainbow is imagine yourself if you go to a concert and you've got very loud speakers next to you. And then you go out, you almost, when you talk, you start yelling because you can't hear. And then what happens to the ovary basically when the ovary starts to have lower egg numbers and they become less responsive to stimulation, the brain will keep sending more messages, more messages to get response from the ovary. And that message is the same hormone that we use to stimulate the ovary. So we can't reinvent them, it's the same thing. So if you have very high level of that hormone and I give you a bit more of that, the ovary itself, well, I've already been seeing that for quite a while. It doesn't make any difference. Give me more. <laughs> so what do we do? We actually reduce the stimulation from the brain. So that's you saw the nasal spray and that lowers the level of your hormone to lower levels to match when you were younger. And that will give the ovary a bit of a break. So it doesn't see that hormone say for around 10 days, 12 days, 13 days. And then we go and start stimulating and hit the ovary. And that will start to the ovary and say, okay, I'll produce more eggs now because I haven't seen that. Hmm. So it, there is evidence that it can produce more number of eggs, yes. So Donna, hi Dr. Shadi. Oh, hi Donna, how are you? Uh, after recurrent implantation failure, would you change protocols usually? Well, if protocols of stimulation or protocols of the transfer. So we got two things over here. So when we have recurrent implantation failure, I have to see what is the problem? Is it the soil or the seed? Now the seed, we said we can test them. Let's test the seed and we look into the seed, make sure that it's genetically normal. Hmm. And if it's genetically normal and have the full set, I'll direct my attention to the soil. And the soil is the protocol of the transfer. So I have to look into it. Why is it not happening? So it's a gamut of all the tests. But again, one of the protocols we say, okay, uh, with the frozen transfer. So I'll get this over here and see 
let's say over here. All right, let's take this. So this is actually um, direction guys with the camera. This is the opposite side. All right, so over here, this is the cycle actually. And it starts from day zero to day 28. And that's what happened actually in each cycle. When you get your period over here, you shed the lining of the womb. So the lining sheds over here. And then it starts to build up and thickens over here till you ovulate. And once you ovulate, it changes the lining and you can see over here becomes deeper, deeper crypts inside the uterus over here. And that's the effect of the other hormone, the progesterone. And basically we put the embryos day 19 or five days after you ovulate. So if you got five days old embryo, we put it five days after ovulation. Now, why is that actually? Because the lining over here, as you can see, the lining does not accept the embryo at any stage of the cycle. You can't put it at any day. It has to actually match after ovulation. So if you ovulate it over here, it has to be five days later because the embryo is five days. And we call there is a window of implantation over here. So the, the lining would accept the embryo only at a certain period. You can't put it like over here and accept it to implant. You can't put it over here and accept it to implant. So it has to be matching five days after implantation. Now what happens sometimes that this window gets shifted a little bit. So it doesn't match the embryo. So if you put like a day five embryo inside over here, but the lining is a bit slower. So by the time the embryo tried to implant, it didn't catch the window. So we say, okay, let's test the lining and make sure they both match. So if I got it frozen, as though it's five days, I push it a little bit earlier or a bit later to match the cycle. And this is where I change the protocol and see what is my lining and make sure it's consistent every month and then put it back in that stage to make sure it lands on the right window of implantation. Hopefully that answer your questions. Uh, Jane, you're 32, all right. And you want to start again, Jane, what do you want to start? And your thoughts on transplanting two embryos at first cycle. Now you're too young <laughs> to put two back in, Jane, uh, at 32. Your chances are very good of uh, put a falling pregnant at first cycle with one embryo. So I say one uh, at a go. Okay, so go one, thank you. Yes. Hi, Dr. Johnny. Oh, Jane. Hi, Jane. How are you? Manal Merhi. Hi, Dr. Shari. We did see you in the past due to low sperm count. Yes. Hi, Manal. Uh, we have done 11th transfer today, all ICSI, all failed. We always got many eggs, but only one to two fertilized. I have also performed NK testing, always fine. Our issue is the sperm. What happens with varicocele conditions and how to treat it? Will that help sperm produce function properly? Also, how do we give Clomid for a year with no change in sperm count? Does this affect any other hormone? Also, will now, how will you treat a high FSH level and what does it mean? Will the sperm donor need to be considered or uh, with the excessive varicocele thought surgery to remove that will help? Very question, Manal. And hi, Manal, how are you? <laughs> Long time no see. Uh, so uh, when you do an IVF cycle, when we did the ICSI, uh, there is the varicocele. And what varicocele means over here, This is usually a graph that shows the male genitals and you can see the blood vessels and the testicle, usually they're very thin. Now in some conditions, they, these blood vessels become very thick like that. They dilate, so they're like varicose veins of the scrotum. Now when they're dilated, the theory is it will increase the temperature inside the testicle and can cause a little bit of problems in the sperm production and can cause the DNA damage of that. Now, this is very controversial because a lot of time those men have surgery to improve the varicocele or treat it, but it affects their sperm count conversely. Now, the whole idea is to increase stimulation and getting better sperm. Now, one of the things that could be tried with a higher FSH, so the brain, again, that's the same hormone that we're talking about that goes from the brain to make eggs. It's the same in men, goes from the brain to go to the testicle to stimulate the testicle to make sperm. So if it's very high, probably the testicle is producing less and less sperm. So in certain conditions like this, I recommend to use a testicular sperm, actually, instead of using ejaculated sperm. And why is that, actually? We know that the sperm in certain men is very sensitive. Once they leave the testicle, 
they get exposed to a lot of oxidants over there on the way and they become very sensitive to damage. And by the time they get ejaculated and used for IVF, their DNA is not intact. So the DNA in the sperm comes in one big strand and any factors can actually make it break down and cause a fragmentation of the sperm. So what are we trying to do is to get the best sperm and the baby sperm is the best one to produce a higher DNA concentration with a one big strand for that. So in certain cases like that, if you have many IVF cycles that have failed and you've done one, it's only one or two low fertilization, you go for testicular sperm. So you go directly to the testicle, just small tissue. You'll find millions of sperm over there. You just take a few, inject them inside the egg. And the hope that will improve. Because you've got two in the equation. So any of the embryos, when you try to make a baby, there's two components. It's the egg and it's the sperm. And if the egg is fragile, you don't want to put extra strain on the egg to put a sperm with a broken DNA. The egg can fix that problem, but it takes a lot of effort and energy for the egg to fix that problem. And that's why you get a low fertilization. So you hope for that you get testicular sperm to improve the fertilization rate for that. Fifi had uh, high four failed transfers with one chemical. Any tips to make one stick? And again, uh, well, sticking the embryos, like four transfer, uh, we'll talk about that into, again, the quality of the embryos. So assuming you tested those embryos, I'll say, well, if you have four put back in, have you thought of testing those embryos before putting it back in? And again, you have to look into all uh, aspects of recurrent implantation failure. So you have to do all the blood tests that can rule it out. Uh, as I said, your thyroid, you have to check that, even thyroid antibodies, your metabolic, your insulin level, your uh, fasting blood sugar, you have to check your vitamin D levels, you have to check your blood clotting levels. Because what happens is when you actually, the embryo tries to implant inside the uterus, what happens is the small blood vessels go and try to implant and to get some nutrition from your circulation over there. And sometimes when the blood vessels are very thin, that goes to the embryo or the baby, the blood slows down. And if you're prone to clotting, to make a blood clot, it will clot inside there and it won't supply the blood to the embryo or the growing embryo over there. So it stops feeding the embryo. So one thing, if we've got any clotting problem that we look into, uh, we give you blood thinners like the Clexane or aspirin, and that will help the blood flow to the embryo when you try to implant. Uh, another blood test is to, take, uh, uh, to check the sample of the lining and to, to check the immune cells too, to make sure there is not any, anything wrong before you put another embryo, because these are precious embryos, as I mentioned before. Uh, Fiona, thank you for your feedback, it's very helpful. What could be a reason, hi Christine, uh, as to why a treatment cycle of injections and nasal spray fail and perhaps be cancelled due to not enough maturity of eggs? Uh, well, it depends. I mean, when you reach not maturity of eggs, did they actually collect the eggs and they were immature? Uh, that reads to us. I mean, when we collect, say, when we collect the eggs, Christine, I'll just clarify. And you look at it in the lab, we have to have mature eggs because these are the ones that are going to be fertilized. And that's why when we do an IVF cycle, Hello everyone, sorry I had a technical glitch, so I'm back again. So if you had any questions, you can post it over here, uh, we come back. So I was talking about the ERA in the last test, uh, the last questions before we had our technical glitch. Yes, the ERA is more or less similar to the test that I usually do. There are two tests, is the ERA and then there is the histopathology, which is basically I take the sample and the, the pathologists look under the microscope. So I send it to the lab over here and they look and they tell me, all right, I took it on day 19 over here and that's where I'm sure it's supposed to put the embryo back in. And they tell me, no, it actually doesn't look like day 19. It looks like day 22. I'm like, what? Well, probably then we have to put the embryo earlier uh, on that cycle to increase the chances of implantations. 
Uh, Lauren, hi Lauren, how are you? Tech issue fixed, yes. <laughs> Gemma, Gemma, I had tubal ligation five years ago after having three healthy babies. Me and my partner wish to now have another baby. Is, still, is, is this still possible? Definitely, it's still possible. And actually that was the first indication of IVF. So when we started doing IVF back in the 70s, uh, the late 70s, that was the only thing that they could treat because of the tubal ligation is just the technical or uh, direction issues. So they can't reach, the sperm can't reach to the egg over here. So basically you get the egg out, get the sperm, put that magic happen in a dish and then put the baby back in. So you've got very good chance of success, depends on your current age <laughs> and depends how many eggs you've got. But it can, it's definitely doable. Now there are two ways of doing it, either reconnecting the tubes it's very finicky surgery. You have to do it under microscope and have to make sure that the tubes are connected and depends how much tissue they removed of that tube. If you go straight to IVF, then the, the success rates is usually uh, depends on the age. So it's not considered you have fertility issues, just the blockage of the tube or absence of the tubes. Uh, Samantha, blood thinners and recurrent miscarriage thoughts. Well, definitely. I mean, we use it uh, for a lot of uh, uh, patients that they do have problems with recurrent miscarriage. Uh, we do a whole blood of tests that we uh, for uh, blood clotting issues. And the blood test that we do is like, uh, you, you hear about a prothrombin gene mutation, factor five Leiden, and we took about protein C, protein S, and patients tell me, what are those? And generally we look at just a few things that can increase your blood clotting. So the blood vessels does not go and when they're very thin and small, the blood stops flowing to the baby and it stops actually giving nutrition. So we give you blood thinners. So they actually part of the protocol to give uh, for patients once they fall pregnant, uh, the blood thinners, either injections or the aspirin tablets. And uh, Ronell, hello, I have had four embryos transferred that have failed. I have been with the same clinic. Should I change? Uh, there has been no reason not to fall pregnant. <laughs> uh, that's a very, very good question, Ronell. I mean, majorly it's about, you build a rapport with your fertility specialist and it's all about uh, what do you feel with fertility specialists and you build a trust when you go through it. Uh, so if you're comfortable with your fertility specialist, be open and talk about them until, and ask them, should I move somewhere else? What are your thoughts about this? Uh, if you're feeling that you can't have this conversation, uh, probably you're not uh, having the full gamut of like rapport with your fertility specialist. So I would say to, to discuss it with him and see if we've got any uh, opinions about that. Or if you can't, you need a second opinion, people always go have a second opinion and third opinion, and then they decide where, where they're more comfortable with. After all, I mean, you, you go see a fertility specialist and one of the factors that you, I think most people like decide is kind of personalities and their, uh, their principles or their kind of philosophy towards fertility matches your philosophy and you feel comfortable with that. Uh, so I'll leave that to you uh, uh, and you can decide with your partner. So Gemma, I'm 31, healthy, non-smoker, all pregnancy, were healthy, had C-sections. Well, that's good, very good. Now that will put you very good success rates. Uh, so it depends what do you want to do. I mean, it's a whole discussion. Do you reconnect the tubes? Then we have to look into your previous surgery note. If they put just clips, can that be removed? Or they removed actually a whole section of the tube. So they removed a whole section of the tube. Reconnecting them can be difficult. And there is a risk of an ectopic if that happens. So the, the surgery itself can be expensive because they use microscope and they say too, too long to stitch the tubes and can have risks of ectopic to have for that. And that's the disadvantage of the surgery. The advantage of the IVF that it's, uh, I mean, it's done on that time and at your age and if it's only tubal factors can have very high uh, success rates. Hmm. Uh, Lauren, hi Lauren, hope you're doing well. Great info and explanations, thanks Sadi. What are your thoughts on estrogen priming, Proganova, pre-FSH? Very good, very good question. Uh, well, estrogen priming, that's another mode of uh, an IVF cycle. So uh, we said the two big ones is the short and the long one. Uh, but some of the new cycles that we are trying to uh, 
uh, give the ovary a bit of rest uh, is emerging. And one of them is the estrogen priming. And the estrogen priming is basically we use estrogen uh, earlier on before the cycle to suppress any hormones towards the ovary. So we give extra suppression and then we give the nasal spray and then move for another uh, 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 medication to suppress the brain hormones. And this is just another way of reducing the brain hormones and making it much, much, much lower for longer period. And that's uh, what it helps with. It, it, it makes the eggs inside the ovary all have a bit of a rest from that hormone for a little bit. And that allows you to grow when you start stimulation, you grow those eggs in a moderate and more controllable fashion. So, I mean, we've got our data in our clinic. It's all retrospectively. When we look back, when we use the estrogen priming for uh, a lot of our cases that have been difficult, recurrent implantation failures, striking results that we've looked at. I know it's not randomized. I know it's not prospective. It's not well-designed studies. But if we look at back, it's the differences between the regular cycle and the estrogen priming were very strong. The only downside of it, Lauren, it's very long cycle, it takes like two or three months and patients like, oh, I've been on the pill for this long, the Proganova, estrogen patches, this medication, this medication, this medication, but it yields results. Hmm. Gemma, thank you, thank you. Missed the explanation, do you the tech issue? Yeah, 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 sorry about that, Manal. Yeah, we were talking about the, the surgery. The varicocele surgery, I uh, wouldn't recommend it unless uh, there is symptoms. So always is there is no pain with the t testicle. It's no discomfort due to the varicocele. Regulate, do not touch it. Because when you remove that varicocele, it can create an imbalance in the testicle and gives a bit of shock. So it can actually, even if there is in the, in the testicle, uh, sperm production over there can actually reduce it over there. So it's counterintuitive for that. So yeah, no touching of this. A testicular sample from the testicle to use it for IVF, yeah, it could produce a better result. Anna, hydrosalpings, get it cleared via surgery or go for IVF? Well, very good questions. So hydrosalpings is one of the tubes, and I was telling the patients and there, she was like, oh, did you get the sausage out? And I was always saying, yeah, it looks like sausage. Mm. So hydrosalpings, is generally when you've got the tubes and these are like say how the tubes look like they're very thin but hydro means fluid and salping this tube is like this so they look very thick the tubes the problem with hydro hydro means fluid this fluid in the tubes or where is it ah direction again i'll look this way so when they have fluids in the tube over here when you do ivf over here so you collect the eggs fair enough you fertilize them and you put the baby back in inside here. Problem is, if this fluid leaks inside here, it's not good for the embryo. We call it an embryo toxic fluid. And it's like this brownish material that leaks out here, been sitting there forever and it's inflamed. So the best way actually to improve success rates is if you do IVF, you can collect the eggs, you can make the embryos, but don't put anything back in till you, you remove that tube to prevent backflow from over here of fluid back into the uterus. Hmm. Samantha, thank you. Uh, I've been told that I have bad eggs due to quality, due to endo. I have three cycles with three to four eggs collected, but eggs do not fertilize. It do, don't make it to day five. My specialist has discussed donor eggs. Does this mean I'll never get pregnant with my eggs? Uh, very good questions. Uh, how it's, it depends on a lot of factor cap. Uh, but having only three cycles of uh, IVF, usually the first one, I'd say, it will give you a lot of information uh, through that. How many eggs do you usually get? How do your body respond to the, the injections that we give? What is the trigger like? What is the quality of the eggs? How does the egg behave when we put the sperm with it? And how do you grow those embryos? Uh, but we have a lot of medications. I was talking to Lauren, I've been speaking earlier. There's a lot of modification to the cycle and uh, I wouldn't give up at this stage. I mean, I, if you don't want to give up, I definitely wouldn't give up at this stage and try to tease it and look at it. What is the bad egg quality and uh, how can we improve the egg quality? either to do the cycle protocol or uh, the stimulation protocol or in the lab techniques of that. 
Uh, I believe, guys, I'm, I really enjoyed this, but I believe we took almost an hour. So uh, probably I'll ask, uh, I go for one more question, and then I'll answer your questions later on. Uh, if you do like this, please press like. I believe that we, we would do more of those. And if you have any suggestions, you can put it down on those questions. I'll get to your answer later on and have an uh, answer to those questions. Uh, but definitely liking it and letting us know what you want. We'll have more of those sessions for, uh, for you, just to enlighten you. I mean, the fertility journey is a very difficult journey when you go through it. And uh, having a discussions about it and talking about it and gaining knowledge to, about your body and the process and how it works just empowers you and gives you a little bit back the, of uh, control over what happens during this cycle. So I'll answer one more question before I say goodbye. So Karen, um, 32 years old, started IVF when I was 28. Our problem is thought to be egg quality. We can't seem to get our embryos to grow past day three. Out of six full stem cycles, we have only transferred three times, one ending in my 17 month old. Congratulations on that. We are trying for a sibling, but we will still have issues taking CoQ10, etc. I'm a non-smoker drinking, no endo, no PCOS. We can't seem to get to the bottom of what our problem is. What is affecting my equality? Very good question. Now, if, when you reach, okay, there are three points over here, Karen. Uh, I need to look into the cycles actually and tease them out and dissect them. But speaking in general, what happens in the lab over here? Uh, I'll do a bit of drawing. Okay, let's, let me draw it over here. And just as an ender. So this is day zero. What happens is you get day zero, you've got the sperm over here, and you've got the egg. When you play the music overnight and the sperm fertilize the egg, you've got 2 p.m. The sperm goes over here. So we call it 2 p.m. When we leave it actually for day three over here, it divides. And this is day three. It divides, become four to ten cells over here. At day four, what will happen is over here, it will divide 60 to 100 times cells over here. So it becomes a lot of cells over here, 60 to, uh, to around 90 cells. And this is, we call it a morula over here at early late day four to early day five and mora is just a fancy name for a raspberry because we have to sound fancy but it basically means raspberry and then at day five over here this raspberry if i go down here will make a pool and this pool will push most of the cells to one side and few cells on the other side so this is what happens so the pool will push most of the cells to, to this side this will become the placenta and this will become the, uh, this will become the placenta and this is your baby. So the big cells are the baby. And this is what means making a pool. Actually, blastocyst means making a pool. So blast means making and cyst is a pool. Again, we can't call it making a pool. We have to call it blastocyst. So why I'm telling you all of this? Well, there are few aspects during the cycle that we know it might be an egg or an embryo quality or sperm quality issue. So we know if we got low fertilization here, if you got mature eggs and it doesn't fertilize, it's probably related to sperm issues. That's low, lower fertilization. But due to when you reach the day three over here and try to reach to day four or five, this process from here to here is controlled con purely by the egg. The sperm doesn't kick in till day four, between day three and day four. So if we look at the embryos at day three, and we can't reach afterwards, it might be a sperm issue because between here and here is purely the egg function. And if you can't carry on up to here and then it drops over here, that might be a sperm issue, not an egg issue. So you need to dissect it to have a little bit more info on that. Uh, anyways, I was really, really happy to have this discussion tonight. I'll answer your questions later uh, through these text messages and I'll go through them. Uh, one by one. Uh, if you've got any more questions, keep uh, asking them. I'll get back to this page and answer them uh, each on their own. Uh, thank you again for joining us and uh, I hope you have a good night later tonight. Thank you.